I Love You Now Die is an HBO documentary that chronicles the trial of Michelle Carter over whether text messages encouraging Conrad Roy to take his own life constituted involuntary manslaughter. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and we are joined today by Aaron Lee Carr, the film's director. And Aaron, the first thing I want to ask uh, is, uh, you know, the documentary, and I was telling you this beforehand, is very, very even-handed. And I'm and what I was wondering was, was it a difficult, was that a difficult tone to set in the film? Yeah, I think that the film really uh, represented in the way that it was constructed my own journey with the case. I think that um, I would start, um, you know, learning about certain evidence or certain events. And um, it's all about sort of guilt and innocence. And, you know, there would be evidence that shifts towards guilt. There would be evidence that shifts towards uh, innocence. And so I think that I really wanted the film to show that um, there are very much two different ways of looking at a story. And we have this sort of very American, this very concretized, this is how I feel about this. And it's, you're not going to change my opinion. And I really, um, as a documentary filmmaker, I really want to push against that. I really want to, for people to sort of change their opinions and have that sort of um, that journey and take that journey with me. So, uh, so when you first heard about this tragedy, um, what made you compelled to say, I want to see if I can, you know, tell this story? I mean, I don't know how you look at that story and you don't think I, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to participate in that story. I mean, I, I was immediately so drawn to it because, um, you know, I am somebody that covers the intersection between mental health and technology as it relates to documentary. And so this is a film and this is, a, you know, basically a subject matter that hits all of those sort of sweet spots. And I really wanted to, um, you know, I think that as a young filmmaker, I think it's really interesting to sort of decode and deconstruct how um, how young people talk without it feeling like this on high presence of like, this is how the kids communicate. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, it was sort of uniquely designed to tell this story. And, you know, it was something that that haunted me. And I think that, you know, I think most of us have had our own issues with sort of mental health and, you know, me being one of those people. And, you know, everybody who pretty much watches the film, you know, has a little bit of sort of recognition and sort of um, identification is what we call it. And so I think that, uh, um, you know, I was sick of people um, screaming about this case without understanding what it was really about. I think if you spend five to 10 minutes inside the case, you recognize this is a, it's a, you know, it's a case about loneliness and about not fitting in and about um, what is it like when your brain is telling you awful things. And I think that suicidal ideation for adolescents is very different than it is for adults. It feels very like, like forever when you're a kid. Um, and so really kind of uh, existing in that space and really understanding it was really important to do so. And one of the most interesting things about the film is the last shot of the film. And I, I, I want to ask you about that because the last shot of that film is such a striking one with, with uh, photos of Carter being shown alongside tweets uh, of her grieving uh, Conrad's death. And what was your thinking that led you to close the film in that manner? Because I thought that was such uh, uh, a compelling way to do that. And I was curious about what your mindset was behind that. So what I love to do when I'm doing these interviews is sort of, um, you know, highlight more understanding. I would say that a lot of always people always think it's like the director had all those thoughts. And I think that I, I would really love this opportunity to call out the editor of the film. Um, he really thought about that. I mean, he his name is Andrew Kaufman. He edited my first three films for HBO, um, a true genius, a true, true collaborator. And I remember we were sitting there watching an early cut and he said, you know, the sort of the tweets of her mourning him are always the most interesting. And he he sort of cut it together so that, you know, there was this maybe, you know, maybe it gets better and sometimes it doesn't. Something about it like not getting better. And I remember that that is just, there's so many documentaries that um, they, like basically it's a present, you tie it up with a bow and there's just nothing that is final about this case or um, easy. And so I thought it was just like the perfect ending and in large credit to his own sort of innovation and really understanding the story. And uh, another aspect that was very interesting with this documentary is that you were obviously uh, making it in the midst of the trial rather than after uh, the trial, the legal proceedings. And I'm and I'm curious, were uh, were uh, 
which uh, were there any of the revelations that you came across in making the film? Uh, which ones, did, or which one did you find the most surprising uh, that uh, that you've encountered uh, making this film? Yeah, I remember sitting inside the the court, and some of the early witnesses were Michelle Carter's friends, quote unquote friends, um, these young women that sort of would get up on the stand and basically disowned her and said, we never liked her. She was a loser. She always, uh, you know, wanted to hang out with us. We never, you know, we never wanted to hang out with her. She was always seeking attention. And there was just this very sort of Heathers-esque uh, montage of women coming up and down in the courtroom, um, just basically disavowing this person. And I thought it was really disturbing um, because it's, you know, what she did was immoral and they were really understanding like what was the legal aspect of it. But this to, to sort of assassinate her on this mean girl level, uh, it just felt so like terrible and mean and unnecessary, if that makes sense. And I think that it really highlighted me for me how alone Michelle Carter is and you know what you you know you have to kind of sit through this trial and every text message you've ever sent is uh, really under a, like a microscope by um, hundreds of people and and then I wondered at my own sort of um, ownership of exploitation because I included that footage in the film um, I think it rendered a sort of more sympathetic portrait um, I think we all know what it's like to lose friends but I think that that was so surprising to me. The domestic violence was really, so. I mean, not I knew about it. Um, uh, that was really scary, um, you know, for the whole family to sort of encounter. Um, I just, it was like, it was just one of the most tense, uh, really weird, scary rooms that also, like it had the sort of um, mundaneness of a trial. And so everybody was sort of on edge and trying to get a seat. And then you would sort of like sit through the testimony and you're like, well, sort of what, what is happening? What can I sort of be reading in between the lines? And yeah, there was a lot, um, just, I mean, I guess like every day I learned something new, every day felt surprising. Um, it's, you know, I covered, you know, I was there every day of the trial. I was there during, um, you know, during, uh, you know, all the, the pretrial hearings and things like that. I mean, for me, it was, at, for me, it was uh, the, the reveal of, uh, the role of glee in her life uh that was just um and that was just something that just like came out of nowhere and i was like dude that's 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 amazing so glee um it was jesse baron who uh the reporter for esquire that sort of was able to uncover and figure out that there were um that there were like basically Michelle Carter was lifting real sentences from the show and from the actor inside her own words with other people. And I, yeah, I mean, it was just sort of, it's really shocking when you see it on the page, but when you see it in like in documentary, it's it's almost so much more weirder because you can sort of experience it firsthand. And a lot of people were like, that was so crazy. Like, why did you wait until the second episode until later in the second episode? And it was a very conscious decision because um, I remember one uh, critic of Mommy Dead and Dearest, my earlier work, um, said it was like a rushing, a Russian nesting doll of horror. And like there was something like new facts kept appearing as you were watching it. And I think that there's a lot of films where it's like you present the facts and then you sort of like, you know, go, you go forward in the narrative in a verite way or something like that. But I want for you as the audience member, I want to keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it and adding to it so that when you are um, when you're sitting there after the fact, after you're watching it, you're just like, what the just happened? Like what happened? And so it's creating something almost like this sort of whiplash effect. Uh, where it's really it's really important where you sort of deploy information. And um, uh, sort of piggybacking something we were, we were talking about earlier, um, you know, a lot of your, you know, uh, you know, while some documentaries approach their films from a very set viewpoint in terms of what they want to, of what they're looking to uh, say with their films, uh, the films in your filmography suggest that you tend to gravitate more towards subjects where there's a lot of gray area. And I'm wondering what about that material draws you in? Yeah, I think that I, I grew up watching things like Capturing the Freedmans by Andrew Jarecki. 
uh, which is about the dissolution of an American family due to a pedophilia scandal. And there was something sort of so haunting about it, but I never knew what the director uh, thought. I never knew what Andrew thought about this family because he was so careful and so deft in sort of his editorial choices. And so I think when I um, when I look at being making films, it's really about like leaving people with questions. It's almost like asking more questions than answering them. And that puts me in a spot because I think that a lot of documentary films are films of advocacy. Like this is what is happening and I'm going to show you what is happening and I feel X way about it. And I am very glad that those films exist like Chasing Coral or um, you know, the cave or, um, you know, free so uh, for, for Sama or, you know, these films that it totally makes sense for that to be the language and the, the way that the film is constructed, but it's just not who I am. Like I, one of my, one of the weirdest things that I've always, I do all these like Q and A's Well, I did Q and A's before this pandemic and people would say like, you know, what did you think about Michelle Carter? And I'm just like, I just gave you, 140 minutes to examine <laughs> what I think and I am never never going to say like how I feel like why would I like you you need to be able to figure that out for yourself and like I swear it's like 90 percent of the messages I get and it's only because I never directly tell you how I feel about it uh and so I think it, it's just so weird human beings are very uncomfortable with gray area and i i apparently feel very comfortable in the gray well uh, that takes care of my next question about what you think of michelle carter but um <laughs> uh but uh in all serious though so i i i find that very interesting that that's what you gravitate towards and i'm curious what subject or subjects are you looking to shine a light upon next yeah, I think that, you know, I did um, At the Heart of Gold inside the USA Gymnastics scandal. I did that for HBO, which really deconstructed the myths surrounding grooming and about that. And then I went on to do Bench Chemist, which is called, um, uh, it's, <laughs> I can't believe I just, it's called How to Fix a Drug Scandal. It's a four part series that just was released on Netflix about two chemists gone very bad. Uh, and that was sort of like a breaking bad meet sort of, um, you know, one of my own pieces. And so when I look at what I want to do next, I mean, I really want to make films about women. I think I'll continue doing that. I think my last four films have been about women. Um, so I'm going to continue in that trajectory. Um, I feel very comfortable in the crime space. I think it's psychologically a bit troubling, but I feel uh, like I can handle it. Uh, mental health, technology, um, uh, motherhood, uh, legal risk, uh, you know, uh, trials. Uh, I'm just, yeah, I, I'm like endlessly fasc fascinated by many things, which, uh, and I usually have about six different projects sort of percolating or cooking, um, just in case like, you know, you know, which one am I going to sort of do next um, and being in contact with people. So I guess just thinking about all these things and uh, trying to sort of move it forward. Well, uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. We wish you all the best during this year's Emmy season. And to all our viewers, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to see our latest content. And don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks again, Aaron. Awesome. Thank you.